Y'all don't understand the struggles of being a black man out here in America and not knowing whether or not you're going to make a home to your churn every night because of the police gunning you down. But don't y'all be out here gunning each other down? Okay, but we ain't talking about that. Hell, don't y'all be rapping about killing each other in music? We ain't talking about that either. We can talk about killing each other in rap music, but we don't like the police killing us. Stay on subject, woman. You brought up your kids. Tyrone, you don't even see your kids. And then, yeah, I be trying to see my kids. You know my baby mamas be tripping because I don't want to be with none of them, so they be holding my kids from me. You know that. Okay, but your baby mama saying you don't give them no child support either. Okay, but I still be going out my way to try to see them. They live five minutes from my house, Tyrone. That is out my way, woman. See, y'all, that's what we don't like y'all black women's mouths. Y'all run y'all mouth too much. Y'all always bringing up stuff that's irrelevant. Well, was you cheating on me, Irrelevant? I only cheated on you 10 times. You act like I do it every day, bro. See, that's why we date women of other races, man. Hey, Booz, hey. It is Lexus Exodus, leader of the Black Women Exodus. How are y'all doing? And like always, if you enjoy this content, please like and subscribe, please share, please comment in the comment section. Let me know that you're listening. Also, if you enjoy listening to my content on the go, the show is now available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts for audio listeners. Go check out my Patreon community where you can get access to bonus episodes and exclusive content and also a private community of like-minded, divested women. It is linked below. Please also follow me on social media platforms. You can check me out everywhere on all platforms at Lexus Exodus. You can find all of this information in the description below. This is another installment of my series called The Blackistan Zoo, where we profile the dusty derelicts, crazy creatures and animals in Blackistan. Tonight, let's continue our discussion about the mythical BBC. And let's continue talking about how it has Black women in a chokehold, even though it doesn't exist. So y'all know, previously we talked about how most are small and less than average at best. Again, just a refresher, we know that the average size of a Dusty is only 5.8 inches uh, last week, we also talked about how it is very dirty and not hygienic. Well, this week, let's talk about how it's also diseased and STD infected because they slang it everywhere with reckless abandon, don't use protection, and how Black women would be better off if they divested simply because it's more likely to be detrimental to your health. And it can cause lifelong diseases that are also life-threatening. So let's get to it. I want to look at some examples that illustrate this. So I want to first talk about this article that discusses how the CDC is indicating STD rates are up 50% for women last year. And most of these cases are caused by whack men in the whack community. So this article is entitled, according to the CDC, STD epidemic in the U.S. is out of control with syphilis, HIV on the rise and 1.6 million cases of chlamydia reported last year alone. Okay, so let's get into it. It says health officials are warning Americans of sharply rising cases of STDs including a 26% spike in new syphilis infections reported last year, the highest since 1991, and most number of total cases since 1948. Sheesh. Um, it says infection rates for several STDs, including syphilis and gonorrhea, have been on the rise for years. 
Last year, the rate of syphilis reached its highest since 1992 and had the most total number of cases since its peak back in 1948. And rates of HIV cases are also spiking, increasing 16% last year alone, the Post reports. Sheesh. So meanwhile, an international outbreak of monkeypox, which research shows to be mainly spread by men who have sex with other men, has recently underlined the country's downward slide in terms of sexually transmitted diseases. Director of the National Coalition of STD, David Harvey, described the situation as being out of control. So he says the syphilis rate dropped after antibiotics became available in 1940s, but cases began to spike again in 2002, mostly amongst bisexual and gay men. By late 2013, the CDC put a stop to the campaign amidst funding issues and escalated cases with over 17,000 that year alone. In 2020, cases of syphilis reached upwards of 42,000. Last year, it jumped to over 52,000 cases. Rates are typically highest in gay men, as well as Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans. The rate for women remains lower than that of men, but health officials noted that it has been on a more dramatic rise in comparison to the opposite sex, being up around 50% last year. And making matters worse, For women, mothers who are infected with congenital syphilis pass the virus along to their babies, which can cause blindness and deafness and even death in young children. Those kinds of cases were mostly rare a decade ago, with cases numbering only about 300. However, last year it spiked to upwards of 2,700. Gosh, so it went from 300 cases to 2,000, almost 3,000 cases, with 211 stillborn or infant deaths. Wow. Woo, Chile. So STDs are at an all-time high. STD rates are at 50% for women alone. I also read, according to the CDC, Black women specifically account for 60% of all new cases of HIV. So where the fuck do y'all think that they are catching these diseases from? Because I don't know about y'all, but I don't see droves of Black women dating interracially. Although divestment is growing online and YouTube, it still is very niche. Divested women definitely make up a very small minority of the Black community. So if the overwhelming majority of Black women are heterosexual women who date and have intercourse interracially within the community, and they account for 60% of new HIV cases, who are they being infected by? It's the BBC, y'all. That nasty, filthy, disease-ridden BBC that Black women love so much. In this article, they said even the babies are being impacted and STD cases have gotten so out of hand that newborn infants are contracting syphilis and passing. Last year, there were 200 stillborn or infant deaths, the article said. And we know a large number of these cases are a direct result of the mothers messing with BBC. Child, y'all gonna stay away from that poverty ping if y'all knew what was good for you, okay? So let's talk about how the BBC is so diseased. Black men are often utilized in HIV advertisements. And shout out to AAAA who shared this with me. So let's watch this and then we'll talk through. I'm on the pill. I'm on the pill. It's Truvada for PrEP, a once daily prescription medicine for adults that when taken every day along with using safer sex practices can help lower my chances of getting HIV through sex. I use condom. Detect this. Living with HIV, I learned I could stay undetectable with fewer medicines. That's why I switched to Devada. Step up. PrEP up. Step up. Prep up. To help keep you free from the risk of HIV. I'm Alfonso, and there's more to me than HIV. Okay. So do y'all see this? Do y'all see this? So that's a lot of advertisement focused on a group of men who only make up about 6% of the population. And the reason why they are represented so much in these advertisements is studies show that these males are eight times more likely to be infected by AIDS as other groups of males. In fact, I looked at some more data from the CDC, and they indicated that one in 16 black men in the United States will be infected with HIV in their lifetime. 
So the reason why HIV pharmaceutical companies are heavily marketing to this demographic is because they are much more likely to be living with this disease. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to stigmatize or ostracize those impacted by STDs. I'm not trying to be phobic in any manner. All I'm saying is let's look at the facts. Let's look at the data. Studies show that if you mess with the BBC, you'll more likely be infected with these kinds of diseases. Okay? So I want to keep going. So a lot of these diseases and these infections are directly caused by them not wanting to use protection. So let's look at this clip that went viral that illustrates that. If you have clear skin, a man think you don't have STDs. Yeah, that's about the truth. You can yeah. eyeball a woman and know if she healthy enough not, to fuck but wrong. But that's not true, though. Mm. But that's not true, though. Rewind. Hold on. You could do what? I said, well, I got the skills enough to eyeball a woman and know if she healthy enough to fuck raw. Mm, 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 mm. What, That's I, so sad that mm, you feel that mm, way. Mm. I ain't never had an STD, though. Child. Do y'all hear this ish? Do y'all hear this ish? This stupid nignog said he can look at a woman and eyeball her and tell whether or not she's safe to mess with raw. He said he can tell whether or not she has an STD by looking at her or if she has clear skin. And he says, I ain't never had an STD, though. <laughs> so he's the type of nigga who say he ain't never been burnt because he just don't get tested. My ex-brother-in-law was exactly like this. He said openly how he never used his protection as well. And he also never got tested. He would say he would be able to tell whether or not he had something simply if his baby mamas told him that they got tested and they had something. So this is that nigga logic. This is the dumbest ish I've ever heard. But this is very prevalent with this so-called BBC y'all be so obsessed with. This is that BBC that y'all love and swear y'all can't divest from. So y'all rather tolerate struggle love, poverty, being baby mamas, being pumped and dumped, and being ride or dies for this mess. Exodus, Exodus. Shout out to my ex. Jada, I love you. G.I. Jane 2, can't wait to see it. All right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, was a, that was a nice one. Okay. I'm out here. Uh-oh. Richard. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Keep black women's names out your f***ing mouth. I said, keep black women's names out your f***ing mouth. Seriously, guys, are you tired of all the negativity and toxicity black women are subjected to in media, music, and online? We are ridiculed, denigrated, and berated daily, and I'm sick of it. That's why I created a private safe space for black women that focuses on divestment, development, and self-empowerment. My private Patreon is for Black women only and is a community where we are affirmed, encouraged, supported, and uplifted. For the cost of a coffee, get access to my Patreon community, which consists of a private Discord group to connect with like-minded Black women, add free bonus content, exclusive private lives, and much, much more. You can check it out on patreon.com slash Lexus Exodus. The link is also listed below. Shout out to my exes. Mm. Okay, so I want to keep going. And I want to look at real-time examples of Black women who are experiencing lifelong dire consequences after messing with the BBC. So let's look at this first girl who was unknowingly infected with HIV at the age of 22 after messing with the BBC. So let's watch this and then we'll talk through. I had to anyway, delete the first half of the video. I was 22, back in 2016, I was dating this guy. He was 28. He was basically my first love. Um, he taught me how to save money and invest. Um, he helped me move into my very first apartment. Um, it was a serious relationship. Uh, we saw each other every day. He would pick me up from work. He would drop me off at work. We would go out to eat. He would wine and dine me. He would take me shopping. He treated me good. So after a year uh, within the relationship, 
we ended up breaking up uh that was february 2016 we broke up and we had slept together one more time well i had got sick i didn't know what was wrong with me and i just never got better so from february 2016 until july 2016 basically six months i was sick i just like I said, was not getting any better. I think I had like E. coli or something and it just never got better, I got worse. So my doctor gave me a HIV test and it came back positive. Uh, a week later, I took another one, came back positive again. So after confirming that I was HIV positive, they went ahead and started me on ART. Um, I went ahead and started taking my medication, following up with my doctor appointments, and by October 2016, I was undetectable, non-transmittable with HIV. And I'm sure some of you are wondering whatever happened with him. Well, like and comment for part two. As promised, I am back with part two of my video, but before I get into it, I just want to say thank you to everyone for the kind words, the love, and the support. Just know that I see you, I appreciate you, and I love you guys too. Let's get into it. So, yes, he was HIV positive. It progressed into AIDS because he did not take the proper steps in regards to rebuilding his immune system and fighting the HIV virus off. So, when I confronted him about... Um, having HIV he acted so nonchalant he did not care so I decided to make it a legal matter and I got a private investigator involved so while the case was being built um, in regards to him I started to really look at my situation for what it was like I was 22 like I was so pissed like I was mad I was depressed you know, I had suicidal thoughts and everything. I, I thought my life was over. Like, I didn't know what to do. I was terrified. Within being diagnosed HIV positive in July of 2016, and then being diagnosed undetectable, non-transmittable in October 2016, um, I was uneducated then myself. I was so confused. Like, I was like, so I have it, but I don't have it. Like, like, you know, what is this? So, um, you know, I started to see a therapist and continue to take my medicine and, you know, was just waiting to hear back from the private investigator. Little did I know that there was going to be a turn in events. Um, my birthday is in November, so I was out of town celebrating my birthday and I got a phone call and it was a private investigator. So he told me that my ex confirmed that he was HIV positive and that he was in the hospital currently fighting for his life. He died two weeks later and I was in shock. I was in disbelief. I was like, what the hell is going on? Like, you know, you told him, but you couldn't tell me. So nonetheless, I began my healing journey and I started to appreciate my life. And here I am today being transparent. Child, this is the BBC y'all are so in love with. This girl was infected with HIV by the age of 22, y'all. 22 is so young. At 22, I had just graduated with my bachelor's degree and was just starting life. I was a baby. I can't imagine what she experienced. And she also got infected by her first love. This is so unfortunate. She says that she was infected with HIV by a dusty, and he was even too cowardly to admit that he knew he had it. So she ended up having to hire a private investigator who finally got him to admit it, and he passed shortly after. Do y'all hear this? Do y'all hear this? Now she has to live with this incurable disease, taking medications, trying to manage this for the rest of her life, dealing with a potentially deadly disease for the rest of her life. 
This is that BBC though. This is that BBC that y'all are so attached to that black women will ride or die for, that y'all will tolerate cheating and struggle love over this, that poverty peen. Y'all love to be pumped and dumped by and be poverty stricken by. The glorious BBC. Let's look at this next woman who contracted HIV from her fiance who was actually on the DL. Hello everyone. So this is a story time. Um, October 14th, 2015, I found out the most devastating news that a person could get, um, well one of them anyway. I found out that I was HIV positive. Um, it was the saddest day of my life because I was in a sanctioned facility. Um, I wasn't able to talk to anyone about it. I was in prison. I wasn't able to talk to anyone about it. Um, the doctor just patted me on the shoulder and, you know, um, told me that hopefully I'll be all right one day. Um, I contracted it from my ex fiance. Um, I did not know that he was on the down low. And if anyone don't know what down low is, is he was basically living a double life. He was bisexual. Um, I never was able to, after I found out and got out of the prison, I did try to contact him, but I never did find him. He blocked and deleted me on everything. So I just lived with what I'm dealing with. My purpose of coming on here and telling you guys is because it's not any of your business, but I hope that I reach someone who is positive right now who have been um, hiding behind the mask. Um, or who feels like no one will accept them or no one will love them. I'm here to tell you that I support you and I love you. And I understand fully what you feel and what you're going through. I have been positive almost seven years. Next month on the 14th will make it seven years that I've been positive and I am undetectable. I take care of myself. I love myself. Um, for the ones who are not HIV positive, may this be a message to you to please, 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 Protect yourself at all costs. I don't care how long you've been with a person. I don't care how pretty you are. I don't care how good he or she treats you. Please go and get tested. Because it can happen to anyone at any given time. Take care of you. Love you. If you have family members who are dealing with it. Or maybe you have family members who have never even came out and told you. Please support the ones who are dealing with it. Because it's already hard with the stigma. If you have any questions or comments. Any negative comments will be deleted. But if you have any comments or concerns or questions that you would like to ask, you can always DM me or you can just post it under the comments and I will definitely answer any questions that you may have. But know that life is not over. It is not a death sentence. It's not a death sentence. Take care of yourself. Love you. You equals you. I love y'all. Be safe and have a great day. Okay, so this woman was engaged to this man and he was living a whole damn double life, effing other men. And she found out that she contracted HIV while she was incarcerated, y'all. And she talks about how she proceeded to contact him and he blocked her and deleted her off of all his socials. This is that BBC, though, that y'all be so obsessed with. The one black woman think is so pleasurable, so massive, it feels so good. Is it worth dying over black women? Seriously, like, is it worth potentially losing your life or living with a lifelong disease over? And she gives good advice. She says to protect yourself. I give you one step further. You should stop messing with Dusty's altogether. If you're that horny and your libido is so high, just invest in a good toy child because this ain't worth it. This ain't it. Okay, let's look at this next story of a woman that explains how this also happened to her. So today is actually National HIV Testing Day, so I thought this would be the perfect time to do this story time. Um, but before we get started, make sure you know your status. All right, so I was actually diagnosed back in 2013. At the time, I was living halfway across the country with my son and my son's father. Now, to be clear, this relationship was already toxic and violent, so I knew I had no business being down there, but I was actually um, just gotten out the hospital with my son weeks prior when he was uh, hospitalized for RSV. And so in my mind, I went down there with the intentions of having this family and also 
lessening the fear of me doing it on my own, right? And so a couple of months after we moved down there, I woke up one morning and I was feeling extremely sick. I was nauseous. I remember being extremely dehydrated, like no matter what I drank or ate, it just felt bad, right? And so um, a couple of days, or not even a couple of days, but a day or two passed and I was still feeling really bad, not getting over it. So I told my son's father, hey, we need to go figure something out. This does not feel right. And so we ended up going to Planned Parenthood. So we get to Planned Parenthood, um, we wait a while, get our blood drawn, we go back separately, and then I'm waiting for what seems like forever for them to, you know, give me some kind of update. Now, I've been tested before, so usually it's like 20 minutes, if that, and then you're in and out. For me this time, it was extremely long, so I already thought that that was off. Um, and then eventually these two nurses, they call me back and they call me into this conference room. One is standing up, the other is sitting down in front of me. And she tells me that my test had come back positive for HIV and I was extremely shocked. And so she explained to me that usually when the test comes back positive, they then have to send it off to go get, you know, additional testing at the state level to confirm it. And so when she told me this, I asked her, well, what was the probability that it would come back as a false positive? And she basically told me that if it comes back positive, it usually is positive in real life, basically. And so that just kind of devastated me. And I remember going home that day um, and just crying now, like I told him at the time and he didn't really, you know, he tried to comfort me in his own way. But as he saw that I was really getting down and depressed because that was what was happening, he told me that he did not want me to cry, that he couldn't have me crying because if he did, then he would have to focus on me and drop out of school, which was the reason he came down there. And so I sucked it up and kept pushing. So it looks like this isn't going to fit all in one video like I hope so. Yeah like for part two i'm sorry <laughs> so a few weeks go by as i'm waiting on the final results they finally come in and it's confirmed that yes i do have hiv and so now instead of being sad lexi i'm more of what the heck is going on lexi and so i start asking him questions asking when is he getting tested when is his test results coming back and it was always an excuse after an excuse right one time he told me that he heard that his ex-girlfriend that he had been dealing with she had hiv but then he also told me that he thought that he had a preliminary test come back positive but then his doctor told him that no it was negative so it was all of these stories that just was not adding up and so eventually because I ended up staying in that relationship after hearing that diagnosis I just honestly did not believe that anyone would want me I thought that this was God's way of punishing me and that this was all that I would ever have so yeah I stayed in that relationship way longer than I needed to but um I found out while still in that relationship that he had actually been living a double life I was able to you know do my sneaky girl stuff get into his phone his extra phone that he actually had left behind and started seeing all of these um, messages on sites like Adam for Adam and all of the and emails and all of these things that confirmed that who I thought this man was for these last three years that I had known him was not who he was at all. Now, like I said before, the relationship was always toxic. I had no business being with this man, none whatsoever. But like I said, I stayed. That was up until the point where he literally put a pulled a gun out on me, put it to my head and told me that he was going to kill me because he didn't like the fact that I had told one of my friends about my status or that she knew what had gone was going on, even though I had kept it from everyone else. And so at that point, I knew that this man was either going to take my life or I was going to have to run for my safety, not just for my safety, but for my son's safety. And so that's what I did. I packed up what I could for my son and myself, and I headed back home with absolutely nothing to my name but a food stamp card. <laughs> and that was probably one of the hardest things that I've ever been through. But that entire time, as I continued to heal, I started to get to know God. And what God revealed to me was that all of that I had went through was for something. And then he first gave me the idea for my podcast. And you can actually check out the full story to this on that podcast, episode 17, God Plus Girl, on every streaming uh, or podcasting app. But 
he gave me God plus girl. And then he showed me that I was going to be the one to help other women go through their trauma too. And so that's my story. And honestly, I wouldn't change it for the world. Child. I don't even know where to start with this. This is so much to unpack. So this woman details this horrific story about how her boyfriend gave her HIV. And of course, she was devastated. She was depressed. She was crying. She was in shambles. And his response was to tell her that she needs to stop crying and she needs to stop being depressed and she needs to suck it up so he can focus on school. Then eventually she does some digging and finds out that he was living a double life and was actually on the DL. And she disclosed this information to a friend. His response was to get mad and to hold a gun to her head because he was upset that she shared what was happening. Child, this this is what I'm saying, y'all. And listen, y'all, I have so many stories like this in my archives, so many similar stories. I'm going to have to cover this probably on another installment of another show, because when I tell you, I came across woman after woman after woman who shared similar experiences like this. And I was shocked. I was shocked when I found out how many women experienced similar circumstances like this. So it's one thing when you read the stats. So I knew that Black women were disproportionately impacted by HIV infections by partnering with these men. However, seeing the data is one thing. When you hear the personal stories, the intimate individual stories of each of these women, I mean, story after story of these women who are beautiful Black women who talk about being in school, being young, being gorgeous, having these careers, having these educations and promising futures, even having children and being married, some of them, and being in what they thought were committed relationships. And it turns out their partners had HIV and inadvertently infected them with it. It's effing horrifying. So I'm sharing these stories because I don't want y'all to think, oh, it can't happen to me. He loves me. I've known him for so long. That's the same thing these women were thinking when they were messing with the BBC. And now look at them. Now look at them. And I'm not saying there's not life after HIV, because there is. You know, these women seem to all have found their purpose. They've created these platforms and are doing meaningful work to spread awareness about HIV and HIV prevention to other women. What I am saying, though, is that they all express having deep regrets. And they all share sentiments about how they wish that they would have moved differently so that they could have avoided this. Beware of the BBC, y'all. Okay, I want to look at this next woman who also shares her story about how she was unknowingly infected with HIV by her partner. From 2003 up until 2005, we were friends. So two years we were friends. Every time he came in town to visit his mom, hey, I'm coming to town. You know, I come over there. We might have an event, get together, whatever. One day, you know, he came in, he came to visit and his purpose for coming visit then was to come and see me. Um, And so he came to see me. We really, you know, we had this conversation and it was a thing of let's get married. You know, here I was, I was, um, what, 23 years old, 22, 23 at the time. And I had never been married. So I'm like, okay, okay. You know, we kind of had this mutual agreement. We decided, you know. And we were both excited about it. Yeah, he was in his 30s. Um, and so, you know, it was just one of those things. We we ended up, I ended up relocating to South Carolina. Um, you know, started school there, got a job. I was living, you know. I say, you know what? Since we're going to get married, since I'm going to be here, I need to get myself established at a doctor's. I was a medical assistant and a phlebotomist. So I always got tested every year because I drew blood from people. You don't know when you're working in that field who has what, unless it's just listed as a phlebotomist. You don't necessarily know this information. So you have to treat every vial of blood or every 
everything you do with blood, you have to treat it as if that blood is something wrong with it. So every year I always went and got an HIV test done, um, got my TB test done, things like that. So I'm like, well, it's time for me to do this stuff anyway. So let me go ahead and do this, um, get tested, and we can do it together. At this point, any time that we had ever had sex, sex was protected sex. Um, we never had sex prior to our wedding night without a condom. We said that what we would do is we would sit, we would, after we got tested, got our results, we would come back together in front of the doctor. And in front of this doctor, we would tell each other our test results, whether it's good, bad, whatever. We would do this in front of the doctor. This is my thought process at the time. Like, the doctor know the answer to his results. So, and we sitting in front of the doctor. He ain't going to lie to me in front of the doctor. You know, even though I was that medical assistant and that phlebotomist and I knew about the HIPAA law and I knew about the Privacy Act, um, I still... You guys, I still did not, it did not click in my head at that time that with the HIPAA law and with the Privacy Act, that the doctor can know all the information, but the doctor can't tell me because I'm not the doctor's patient. Our test results come back. We come back to the doctor's office. We're sitting in front of the doctor. I tell him my test results said I was negative. He tells me his test results said he was negative. The doctor ain't flinch, cough, tw twitch. Nothing. The doctor ain't do nothing. So, two days before the wedding, we come to Florida and we go to his mom's house. Before the, re the rehearsal dinner and, every and practice, all that stuff was that Friday. So, on that Thursday, we get to his mom's house and everybody's inside and she pulls me into her garage. And she pull, she, she comes, she says, I want to ask you a question. Okay, sure. I'm thinking she asking something about the wedding, or, you know, whatever. She says to me, has he ever said anything to you about HIV? So, I'm sitting here like, what? Like, no. Why would you ask me that? It's never, I ain't never heard nothing about HIV. She was like, well, just go ask him about HIV. So, I say, you know what? So, it ain't no com no confusion, no mis miscommunication, no nothing. I say, wait right here. I go in the house. I ask him to come into the garage. I say, I need you to come outside for a minute. I say, so, and then I lay, I say, so your mama told me to ask you about HIV. What is she talking about? He looks at me and he was, and then he looked at his mama and he was like, HIV? I don't know what she's talking about. What you mean she's asking you to ask me about HIV? Why are you telling her to ask me about HIV? What are you talking about? His mama ain't open her mouth. She ain't part her lips. She ain't say nothing. She ain't say nothing. I say, well, you know what? I say, I don't know what's going on. And at this point, his mom does have did have times where she fabricated stories. She wasn't always truthful about stuff. We go on. We had a rehearsal dinner. Had a practice for the wedding. Saturday the wedding happens. Wedding night, you know. It's our first time ever having unprotected sex. Two months later, I end up finding out that I'm pregnant. The day before Thanksgiving on November 21st, 2007, I called my doctor's office because I was nauseous, vomiting, dehydrated, all pregnancy related. I'm coming into this office and I am just sick. So they take me into this little room. The doctor comes in. And the doctor asks him to step out of the room. And then she says, well, everything was fine except one thing. And <clears throat> I could tell, <clears throat> oh gosh, my voice going away on me. I could tell that she um, wanted to tell me something. Like she had something to tell me. And it was like, how do I tell this woman this? That's the look she had. So, and of course, I'm sitting there, I'm drowsy to give me IV fluids, nausea medicine, I'm drowsy, but I'm looking at her like, okay, what? <laughs> and so she says, everything with your labs look fine except one thing. And I'm thinking she's going to tell me my diabetes have came back, gestational, because that's what happened with my oldest daughter, I had gestational diabetes. No, my glucose was actually fine. And what was wrong was the fact that uh, she said, well, your labs came back and said you're HIV positive. And I just kind of sat there and I just, you know, I, I looked over and I just stared off at the wall. I, I was too ashamed and too in shock to even look this woman in her eyes. 
I, when she said that, I just immediately looked off and I looked at this wall and I'm staring at this wall. And I'm just looking at this wall like, did she just say what I think? She, like, I'm trying to process what she's saying to me. And she kind of, you know how you reach out and touch my hand? She touched my hand and she startles me. And I'm like, I look over at her and she's like, do you want me to bring your husband in? Do you want me to tell him or do you want to tell him? And I said, no, bring him in. And you tell him, because if you're telling me I'm HIV positive, he's the reason why. He just sat there nonchalant like, well, we'll get through this. We'll work this out. I'm here. I'm not going nowhere. Blah, blah, blah. So we leave out of that appointment. We get in the car. And he says to me, um, don't tell anybody. I didn't tell anybody. And I didn't tell anybody because he told me not to tell anybody. I didn't tell anybody because I had to still process this myself. I was working a third shift job, doing shipping and receiving for Academy Sports and Outdoors. I was, you know, going to school still. So I was not only, not only was I working at night, but I was getting up in the morning. I was going to school, um, you know, trying to get through these classes with this on my mind. All this stuff. I had just started a new semester of school. This is, you know, almost the end of this semester, getting ready to start spring semester. Like, just so much stuff. <laughs> Just all at one time. So I didn't tell nobody because I just had to deal with it myself first. So moving right on, you know, I moved back to Florida. I ended up seeing a case on the news about a homosexual couple. One giving the other one HIV without disclosing their status. And that person got sentenced as a felony crime for five years, which is the max in the state of Florida. Every state that has these laws have different uh, statutes. They have different um, sentencing time frames. All that stuff. So, I called the sheriff's office and I explained to them this is what happened. And my first question was, it, being that we are married, is this still a crime? And the, my answer was absolutely 100%. Even though we were still married, it was still a crime because he failed to disclose his status to me, period. So, once I filed those charges and got the police report and all that stuff done, and they were able to actually uh, officially research and get this information, they found out that he, not only did he know that he was HIV positive, but that he also knew that he had been HIV positive since August of 2002. Now, if you remember, I met him September of 2003. So a year prior to me ever meeting him in my life, he had already known his diagnosis. Detective Fudge called me and he said, well, we've investigated. We got all of this, inf you know, we got stuff. We just need something that's solid and that's going to stick. So <clears throat> most states, a lot of states have it where if one, as long as one person consents to a conversation being recorded, you can record the conversation. So I gave consent to have my conversation recorded. So I, 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 um, I got him on three-way. I say, okay, go ahead and start recording. I'm finna click over. I'm finna call him. I say, well, I gotta go see a psychologist. I say, and the psychologist already said to me that they have these questions that they want me to answer so that they can better know how to service me and how to help me through this new diagnosis and through all this, this stuff that I'm dealing with mentally. And so he, I say, but when I ask you these questions, you never want to tell me. I said, I just need help. You say you want me to come home. You say you want this marriage. You don't want a divorce. You don't want to go to jail. You don't want none of this stuff. I said, so you got to help me out. And so he said, well, what questions? What's, what you need to know? What you need to know? I'll answer whatever it is. So in my, I'm sitting there. Now, listen, I'm sitting there on the edge of the bed, holding the phone. Phone. He said, he going to answer all these questions. He answered every last question. I asked him when was he diagnosed. That's when. That's when he said he had been he he had he had um, been diagnosed August two thousand two, which that confirms what they had already investigated and found out. I asked him if he knew who who infected him. He had no idea. <clears throat> he said he think he had a clue of who infected him, but he didn't really have an idea. Um, just other little questions that i got so once it was done i could disconnect him off of the three-way and i said you got it detective fudge said oh yeah i got it i did an interview with the news station in south carolina 
because I wanted them to, I wanted people in South Carolina to know. I wanted them to know that um, if you have had sex with this man, if you have been put at risk or, and you haven't been tested, number one, you need to go and get tested. Number two, if you are diagnosed HIV positive, it's a crime. You can hold this man accountable because, of course, only I can charge him one time. But if multiple people come forward and file charges, the longer he will be in jail. And not only that, even if for me he only got charged five years in Florida, they're in South Carolina. He could have got 10 years in South Carolina plus a $5,000 fine for each case that was brought against him. Um, so within the five years that he worked at BMW Manufacturing in Greer, South Carolina, he had been sleeping with multiple, multiple people. Okay. Multiple people. And he had started working there in the paint shop. He went from the paint shop to the assembly line. So he was around multiple people on different things that he's done in that facility for the five years that he worked there. So, you know. People went to go get, get tested. And then, of course, when they saw his face on the news, that really sent the whole city of Spartanburg, Greenville, and Greer and all the surrounding areas in an uproar. Everybody was going to the clinic. I said, let me tell y'all something. I didn't know that I had that much power to send all these hundreds of people to the clinic. The clinic got so many people, they was running out of tests to test people, y'all. They was running out of tests to test the people because I had so many people that started going because they saw this man face on the TV or I called them. He had been sleeping with people at the job. Them people was lining up at the medic to go get tested. My friend called me and she said, girl, these people out here in line. She said, she said it was literally women saw each other in line and was arguing and fighting because they didn't know that they had done like... They was mad that the other person had a slept with. Like, man, you got other things to be mad about, like possibly having HIV. Oh, my Lord, y'all. This is crazy. This is so crazy. Um, this video is over an hour long. If you'd like to check out the full video to listen to this woman's full story, I will link it below. Her name is Ladybird. But she talks about how she married a man who was 14 years older and how he lied and preyed upon her and how he met her a year after his HIV diagnosis, but he still lied about his status and kept that from her. And she was a phlebotomist, y'all. So she knew the risks of HIV. She got tested yearly because she interacted with blood as a part of her profession, right? And she knew the risk. She, she was aware. And so she even went to the doctor with her partner to get tested together. And she read the results in front of her doctor. She even waited till they were married to have unprotected sex. And she still got infected with HIV all because she was messing with the BBC child and she talks about in this video how people call her foolish for not asking to read the results meanwhile i know a lot of motherfuckers who fuck raw on the first night so y'all got y'all nerve i think she did her due diligence here and she did everything she was supposed to do to protect herself but she still got got by the bbc this is why i encourage every black woman to divest from the bbc and what boggles my mind is this dude lied in front of the doctor and the doctor said nothing. Side note, like, I'm so sorry, y'all. I know there are HIPAA guidelines, but I'd have to intervene. Even if I was a medical professional, I don't know what could have been done here. But, you know, I would have sent an anonymous letter or something because ain't no way I'm going to sit here and let your punk ass lie to this lady about your HIV status knowing damn well that you're positive and that you'll infect her neck. As a matter of fact, my cousin went to couples counseling with a guy she was engaged to. And the therapist said to her, hey, I can get fired from letting you know this. But the dude that you're engaged to is a narcissist. He's, he's a textbook narcissist. And he doesn't care about you. You need to leave. Child, I couldn't imagine being a doctor and seeing someone lie about their HIV status in my office and not saying anything. That's crazy. Like, damn, like refused to be in the room or something. So she would get the hint. But 
Anyways, this is so f***ed up. She said his mom even knew and tried to tell her. She said when they were about to get married two days before, she pulled her aside and said, did he tell you about HIV? So she confronted him in front of the mother and he still lied and still continued to be deceitful and still hid his status. Child, what a crazy story. Like, sis, I can ride with you on everything else, but I can't ride with you on that. The mama pretty much told you this nigga is HIV positive and you proceeded to marry him anyway. This is absolutely awful. Um, This woman did her due diligence, got tested, waited till marriage to have unprotected sex and still got infected with HIV all because she messed with the BBC. And he was so disgusting after she left and prosecuted him and news got out. The whole damn city flocked to the clinic to get tested. Even all of the employees at his job that he was messing with, they got tested. So he was just a trifling, disgusting demon. A a low down, dirty, deceitful, monstrous person. Child, this is that BBC, though, that y'all so obsessed with. Just nasty disease, in a lot of cases, deadly. Not only is it less than average at best and typically not mutually gratifying for the woman, it's also dirty and disease-ridden. But this is that BBC Black women be so obsessed about that y'all will ride or die over, that y'all will tolerate cheating and mistreatment and struggle love for. This is that BBC that y'all will experience single motherhood and permanent poverty for. The damn BBC. All right, y'all. That's all I got. Until next time. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Even if you think I should be bigger, I don't If y'all come across a red iPhone, can you please bring it to the sound stage? Red iPhone, appreciate it.